and she is a molecular biologist with a strong background in basics of human diseases. And uh, glad to see that she finished her uh, graduation and masters in Delhi, and then went to Vienna to do her PhD in vascular biology. She has had some presentations in European Society of Cardiology Congress, and has some publications in circulation and blood. Thank you, uh, Smriti, for joining us. And now I request uh, Professor Padma Kumar, uh, Professor and HOD at uh, KMC Manipal to say a few words before uh, both uh, uh, distinguished ladies table of the presentation. Professor Padma Kumar. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Rendan. My Hello. Uh, hi. <laughs> Uh, okay. Anyway, there is a nice that this topic has been arranged. Pulmonary hypertension is a very important disease process, as all of us know. Most of the symptoms in cardiology can be attributed to pulmonary hypertension. So for the students, uh, it is a very important differential diagnosis when they deal with any patient with heart disease. And I always feel that pulmonary hypertension is very important because there is a spectrum of causes which produces pulmonary hypertension. And if you see the causes of pulmonary hypertension, it covers almost half of Harrison's internal medicine. So, and so it needs that invariably means that you have to do extensive workup whenever you get a, pa get a patient with pulmonary hypertension because many of them are correctable causes. And so the treatment mod uh, modality will definitely vary depending on the etiology of pulmonary hypertension. And also the therapy is also rapidly evolving. Every couple of years, we find a new drug has been discovered for pulmonary hypertension. And the people are living longer. That is a good thing about it. When I finished my DM, pulmonary hypertension was a very fearsome diagnosis. But now we see people living five years, 10 years on disease modifying agents of pulmonary hypertension. So without wasting much time, let's go and hear an authority speaking on the clinical and basic aspects of pulmonary hypertension. Thank you for this kind introduction and the very valuable um, uh, comment towards the students because this isn't only rare disease. If you look, how do we advance this? If you look, this is our disclosures. You know, I've worked with companies and I work with PhDs. This is also my disclosure <laughs> towards Samriti because I think we have to partner, you know, we all have to partner to get new um, solutions. So a central message of my presentation is that in pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is uh, the rare, uh, patients are diagnosed very late and that's very common. And it, you can see that at the time of a PAH diagnosis, patients are in class three and four in 75% of cases. And I think it's a very important concept um, regarding treatments. Uh, let me start simple now and talk about pulmonary hypertension as compared with normal blood flow. And you can see here, this is a cycling heart with the blood pumping from the uh, right ventricle pulmonary artery to the lungs and returning via the, um, the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. And the normal pressures are shown here it has been found in normal controls that mean pressures between 14 and 20 millimeter mercury, which is um, about the average of normal. And it's, it's very hard to, to find the normals because as we age, mean pressure increases. So the, the core of the condition, the condition pulmonary arterial hypertension, and you can hear from what I say, I speak about pulmonary hypertension, and pulmonary arterial hypertension. And to, to be much more uh, distinct in the definition, pulmonary hypertension is everything, all the different levels of pressure elevation in the circuit. Pulmonary arterial is when the vessels are occluded and you can see the little ring here. And if you do a close up, you can see pulmonary vascular disease. And this is really my specialty. And that is only a small segment of pulmonary hypertension. You see a typical pulmonary artery with a lamina elastica externa. Do I have to use my laser pointer? Huh? Let, me, let me do the laser pointer. So this is the pillows of the intima. It's called intimal hyperplasia. Here is the uh, lamina elastica interna. Then it's a smooth muscle layer. 
that is usually thicker than normal. And the outside is the lamina elastica externa that separates the vessel structures against the adventitia that is usually fibrotic. So you have three changes, intimal hyperplasia, smooth muscle hypertrophy, and adventitial fibrosis. And on the right panel, you see if intimal hyperplasia becomes occlusive, there's no more flow. So you could say that the pulmonary vascular disease becomes obstructive and the vessels occlude. The gene that's responsible is the uh, BMPR2 receptor and it's shown here. Um, it, it sometimes comes in uh, homodimers with the ALK1, which uh, commits some central signaling to the SMUT pathway and then to further on to the nucleus. And there's different ligands for the BMPR2 receptor. One is BMP910, one is um, hydrochloroquine, which uh, decreases BMPR2 uh, degradation because in pulmonary hypertension, BMPR2 is down. All the mutations are either loss of function or um, um, uh, de uh, diminished function mutations. And you can also affect the pathway with inhibition of TNF-alpha with uh, enhancing downstream signaling by FK, FK5 or 6, which is tacrolimus. And um, there's other genes like the caveolin, the endoglin, the KCNK3 or task channel. And there's the intracellular erf 2 ak 4 which is a, um, involved in mitochondrial um, stress uh, adaptation. And that's the gene that has been discovered some, some, I think four or five years ago as the um, mutation underlying familial um, lino occlusive disease. So even if you think this PAH is so rare and um, BMPR2 mutations are not so common, and there's also a laughing, I'm sorry, and there's different um, agents interfering. Even if we think this, then there is a cons consistent downregulation of BMPR2 expression across etiologies. And this, I think, is a very important slide where you can see that in hereditary, BMPR2 is down, but also in drug and toxin, CT connective tissue disease, polar pulmonary, and congenital heart disease compared with a normal level. This is gene transcription level. Uh, let me go a step further. <clears throat> and bring in here another person that is not uh, here today, Max Paul, one of my PhD students outside of Samriti. He actually looked at the role of endothelial cells in pulmonary hypertension because we believe that BMPR2 is in, um, uh, expressed in endothelial and smooth muscle cells. And he took a mouse, made it hypoxic, and um, um, injected it with Sugen, which is an inhibitor of VEGF signaling. And you can see here, this is, um, the, this is the targets of the Sugen. And uh, this was published, actually, you can create a, a mouse model of pulmonary hypertension that mimics very closely um, human pulmonary arterial hypertension with significant internal hyperplasia. And Max Powell did something different. In addition to the sutin, he knocked out VEGF receptor 2 in a study that was recently published. And those mice had an endothelial cell targeted uh, deficiency of VEGF receptor 2. This is the control. This is the hypoxic. This is the KDR deficient. And you see they have much more endothelial cell proliferation, and the hypoxic KDR even more so, and this is quantified here. So he was able to replicate pulmonary vascular remodeling by interfering with the VEGF signaling pathway, by deleting the receptor that is called KDR in the mouse. So you can see that there is more than a single gene involved and um, you can also see that the mouse model for pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension that is very commonly used, that it can be mimicked by an in vivo manipulation of the VEGF receptor pathway. So let me come back now to how do we define, I've been talking about pH and I've been talking about PAH and here is the definitions. Pulmonary hypertension is any mean pressure above 20. 
precapillary is if the mean is above 20, the wedge less than 15, and the PVR, the pulmonary vascular resistance, greater or equal three. You calculate resistance by dividing a pressure gradient by the flow. So if you have a wedge of 15, a mean pressure of 35, it's 35 minus 15 would be 20. And if you divide that by the flow, which is a cardiac output, let's say five to make it simple, then this is 20 divided by five would be four. So this would be a case of PVR greater three of pulmonary, precapillary pulmonary hypertension. And in this category, there is pulmonary arterial called PAH. And there is also, you see there is a one and a three. So the two is out because the two is postcapillary. PH due to lung disease, there's chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and the other forms. So this is the more rare, the PAH. And this here is the definition. And anything else you see is postcapillary, very common. Almost everybody has it, was, it was uh, said in the opening of this uh, seminar. Very true. And here it is a comorbidity of left heart disease. It's not a main disease, it's a comorbidity. And you can stratify isolated post capillary pH. It's probably uh, almost more than two, more than three quarters of all pH due to left heart disease is, is IPC pH. But there's a small proportion, probably 12%, that have a PBR greater three volt units called CPCPH. And this is a particular subset, and we haven't completely understood this particular subset. It's probably also of different etiologies. So let me highlight precapillary pH is the denominator for these conditions that have a um, an active pulmonary vascular resistance greater or equal three. It may be 2.4 or 2.3 according to large databases, but the de current uh, guidelines have settled on three. So the diagnostic algorithm is, is very simple here. It starts with the expert center. So if you have, it, if you have any doubts, send there. It's not wrong. And the expert center, they do a VQ. They do an echo, of course, because echo is usually the basis. They do a VQ and they do a right heart count. So this would be the simple version of diagnosing pH. It's still much more difficult. Let me guide you through. This is, a, this is the echo. Uh, this is the, I'm sorry. This is the chest X-ray of a typical um, PAH patient. You see the little hump here, which is the pulmonary artery. And uh, this would be the VQ scan. We would do inhalation and perfusion. It's not done in many centers anymore, but it's, it's a very, very robust test to exclude in this case, pulmonary uh, emboli or chronic thromboembolic disease. And this would be the echo of this patient with a very huge right atrium compressing the left atrium and a huge remodeled right ventricle with a, a, a lots of trabeculae. And you, you see the valve still closes, but uh, if I showed you, that would be significant for a cuspid regurgitation. The septum shifts to the, to the left side in systole. So this is a very typical picture of pulmonary, most likely pulmonary arterial hypertension. In pulmonary venous hypertension, you don't see a small compressed left atrium. In CPCPH, you don't see this type of of um, enlargement and dramatic uh, um, bloating of the right atrium. And the clinical classification was also addressed in the, in the preface of our uh, conversation here. We have five groups, many different conditions, goes right through internal medicine. Pulmonary arterial is the rare, but very clean pulmonary vascular disease um, condition. Chronic thromboembolic is also a very clean pulmonary vascular disease condition. Much more difficult, pH due to left heart disease, where pH, I would call it a comorbidity of left heart disease, and pH due to lung disease. Many faces of pH due to lung disease. Uh, very hard to diagnose oftentimes, very common, no specific treatment available, except for those who look like PAH. Those are treated like PAH. 
and then there's pH with unclear mechanisms. If you have any questions, please interrupt. I, I try to be simple. First step, exclude left heart disease. Please look here. This is an echo of PAH and PH left heart disease. I mentioned a simple way to diagnose is to look at the left atrium. So squished, small, compressed left atrium is usually PAH and a, a still enlarged left atrium with significant pulmonary venous signal. This is PAH left heart disease. And we can also measure pressure gradients in the cuff. You see here a typical case of precapillary. You see the wedge pressure undulating around this uh, very low eight millimeter mercury. And then if you open the, the balloon of the Swangans catheter, you see the jump of the pressure curve. So the level of the pulmonary artery is far above the wedge level. And so you get a very high diastolic pressure gradient, which is here, this diastolic pressure minus the wedge pressure, or the total of the transpulmonary gradient, which is the difference between the mean pressure and the wedge pressure. So uh, in, in this case, which was a flail mitral leaflet, you see that big V wave, no gradient, the, the DPG is even negative, which is an artifact, of course, because it's a, it's a momentary uh, assessment. It's not uh, following the whole cycle, it's just a point measurement. Uh, management of pH left heart disease is very clear. I'm not going to talk about this. It focuses on the left heart and on comorbidities. It's very interesting because I call pH in left heart disease a comorbidity of left heart disease, but uh, management of comorbidities is sometimes easier than managing pH left heart disease, a good example is amyloidosis of the heart. You can treat with, with um, different agents that are, have come up over the past years. Um, the amyloid, uh, TTR amyloid in the, in the myocardium, but you cannot treat directly the pH. So second step, exclude CTEF. Chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is a very clean and very clear and very hopeful pulmonary uh, hypertension subform, you have proximal obstructions, you have distal obstructions, and then you have the very distal obstructions, which are here. They, they go directly from the organized thrombus to the vascular lesions as shown here with less than uh, 500 micron diameter. And it's very important to know about this uh, because then you know what you can reach. Ventilation perfusion is very clearly positive. You see the perfusion with the wedge-shaped defects and the clean ventilation, and of course, in agreement with this, the pulmonary angiogram, which is the gold standard. And I like to show this. Uh, we've started to look at pulmonary vessels much more routinely than we have done. This is a very easy examination and you gain a lot of insight. Uh, usually CTEF is, is hard to diagnose, but if you have this, there's no doubt. And uh, um, I would recommend to use a good imaging in CTEF. Third step, how do we treat? Well, we all know there's a PAH risk calculator, green, yellow, and red, and a number of determinants of prognosis that predict the estimation of one year mortality. This is okay. And I mean, you can guide you uh, in your algorithm to what is called low intermediate and high risk. And you would use Today, it's very clear we have to start with combination. I have always started with the maximum treatment. As I said in the beginning, central message, they come late. So who may appear intermediate risk is already much higher risk. And uh, I think a major mistake of treatments has been that we have, we have taken too easy the so-called intermediate risk patients because they, 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 in my mind, have all a high risk status if, if they are young. Because if you have one inadequate clinical response, you are far towards the uh, demise than, uh, than you, you would be if you hadn't had an inadequate clinical response. This is usually a, a, a very bad sign. And I will show you a study that illustrates that. Three recent studies have evaluated, evaluated validated the ERS ESC risk score, the Swedish, the comparer, and the French, you know. And what I point out here is that still, with all these risk calculations, low risk is very rare. 
because they come very late. It's, it's, it's again there, it's 17% is low risk. This is exactly what I showed you in the beginning. This is the American style, it's the same. Uh, I, I'm very, uh, I'm not so happy about risk stratification as you can see, because I think a physician has to put in their uh, algorithm uh, to judge right. But overall for a guideline, this is probably useful. So we have the endothelium pathway, the prostacyclin pathway, the NO pathway, and here two drugs, the SGC stimulators, which is reosiguat, verisiguat, and the PD-5 inhibitors. So we are very successful using those. We, uh, according to the guidelines, we reassess every three to six months. That's the key message from the guidelines. And as we, this is the slide I wanted to show you. This is a uh, analysis of seraphine and Griffon, and it showed that morbidity events were associated with an increased risk of death. In simple words, if you have one worsening, you are sliding towards the mice. You know, you are sliding up on the mortality curve. Please prevent uh, worsening. Worsening is the worst. It's all about the right heart. If you get worse, the right heart fails. This is the famous study from um, Madis van de Verdonk, where she showed that in a, a, two populations walking the same distance, RV and diastolic volume and ejection fraction determined outcome much better. So the right heart is in the center. Uh, the effects of treatments are quite low. The lowering mean PAP is, is, is very minor. So some centers in the world, particularly the Japanese, have started to upfront high dose prostacyclines in combination. This is an example of a patient evolution from 2007 to 11. You can see that the EKG improves and before all the pressure normalizes. So this is a model case. I agree, is it Japanese? But, and they may be a little different, but it's a, for me, it's, it's a very stimulating uh, concept of uh, hit hard and early as a, as a um, model to remodel the pulmonary vessels. Maybe possible. I do believe so. So now we get to, to the other treatment option, which is venous thromboembolism CTEF. So my, my first part of treatments was, was about PAH treatments, PAH with, with vasodilators. My second part is on venous thromboembolism. And I wanted to show you quickly, we have a, uh, a spectrum of disease in venous thromboembolism going from tip to head, from the toe tip to the head, um, uh, with a common condition DVT and acute PE and a very rare condition CTEPH. And uh, we don't really know how acute PE leads to CTEF. It's, 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 there are different numbers uh, in the literature. Andy Verha recently uh, published that in 1,000 survivors, CTEF incidence was about 3%. Maybe possible, but we still don't know. And for, we don't know pathogenesis because um, you see, I'm sorry, there's a misspell, risk factors, because you see that uh, very strange conditions like VA shunts, splenectomy, recurrent VT, etc., that leads to CTEF. How come? We found that inflammatory conditions are particularly proposing, predisposing uh, to CTEF and CRPD dimer, if, if you have both high, you have a poor outcome. This is a typical foot of a CTEF patient. And you can see anything like the cyanosis, the infection, the um, thrombosis, congestion. And this is where I'm with Samriti today, like asking the question, how does acute PE become CTEF? Mm -hmm. What did you do? Okay. <laughs> I did not do anything, but no, of course you did, that. <laughs> you did it all. So what my study was basically to understand how as you see here, the left side acute PE transforms into a non-resolving CTEF, which is highly fibrotic and does not goes away, leading to vessel obstructions. And you can appreciate that acute PE is very blood rich and it's fresh thrombus as compared to the chronic thrombosis, which is more collagenous. So my part was to understand how come red part transforms into white, to put into simple words. And as Irene has already mentioned that inflammation, infection, everything, CRP, D-dimers, all of them are related inflammatory parameters that are at the forefront or are at the acute conditions. So what happens when a body 
reacts or when a body sees these kind of inflammatory markers, the first cells or the first defenders that come to our rescue are the neutrophils. And how do they do this is basically three different processes that we see. First, they either degranulate, so they release some cytokines, some inflammatory cytokines and degrade the bacteria or neutralize it. Another way is they can capture the bacteria by the mechanism of phagocytosis, where they engulf it and then they degrade, which was the concept was known in 2004, that they can also sacrifice themselves and just release all of their components called nets. So neutrophil extracellular tract. And as you can see, everything that is in the neutrophils, even the enzymes, DNA, histones, everything is spit out. And these extracellular matrix capture the bacteria. And this also happens in the how these nets look. This is the staining from our group. Here you see on the cover slip, these round cells are neutrophils. And when they are undergoing netosis, these are the traps that they form where the bacteria or the path. This is a very nice video which shows from the Fuchs group where they show that platelets uh, or the nets act as scaffold for platelets to adhere. And you can see platelets in red and nets in green. Uh, where the platelets are, they act as scaffolds to attach and other than the antimicrobial mechanisms, nets also play a role in thrombotic mechanisms by acting the scaffolds for platelets. And since neutrophils, as I mentioned before, are mainly composed of DNA and the extracellular DNA, if you add DNA cysts, which at this point they are added, you can see basically the main important component is DNA, and the DNA cysts can be effective if we apply them at an acute stage. For this, uh, I will go a bit into the basic side, and what we do in our group is we have a which actually replicates the human DVT, the deep vein thrombosis that was mentioned before in the talk. Uh, very simply, what we do is we have the inferior vena cave of the mice. We use a ligature to constrict so that there is still 10% blood flow. And in this setting, after around eight to 10 hours, there is thrombus formation. So, and this setting clearly or represents of blood flow. So this is as close as we can get to the clinical setting to understand the process of DVT and venous occlusions. What I did particularly, or what we uh, aimed was to understand is how do they impair thrombosis. So what we took is we took a mouse, did the ligation, and infected them with the staph aureus. Later on, another group of mice similarly treated or similarly infected was found was that after two weeks of thrombus induction, the mice with infection, these blue bars you can see, they have much higher thrombus rate, whereas the green ones which were treated with DNAs had much higher role and DNAs can help encounter. To confirm, this is where you see the histological stainings of the mouse clots. So you see this is control infected and infected with DNA treatment. So you see that the mouse clot has neutrophils in the mice and they have less nets in the controls, much more in the infected group. And after treatment, the infected mice have much less nets, which coming back to our patient samples, here you see a PEA, the pulmonary endotorectomy, which is one of the gold standard treatment for CTEF, you see the excised clot, the surgical numbers, which is highly organized, collagenous and fibrotic. Whereas on the red, right side, you have a fresh, still forming, still organizing clot, which is not that fibrotic. And this part has, part has much more smooth muscle actin and fibroblast-like properties. So much more uh, advantageous and much more hypertrophic properties are in the white clot. So this is how a CTEF thrombus looks in the arteries. To base, another basic mechanism what we wanted to understand was how does this red transforms into white. Now we know that red component of the red thrombus has nets in it. Nets promoted the differentiation towards collagen producing cells. And you see here much more expression of collagen 1 and collagen 3 and fibroblast proteins. Once there are nets in the circulation or in the clot, they drive the run basic mechanism that was unknown. And to sum it up in very simple words, you have a seed of thrombus which is composed of red and white uh, specimen parts neutrophils at the line of defense, they undergo a netosis. You have a lot of nets and a lot of inflammatory markers in the circulation, which react or interact with monocytes or the blood monocytes and leads to transdifferentiation causes mediated by the TGF beta signaling, which is a bit out of context of this talk, but we did see that TGF beta is also the central regulator. So one part of, we could at least pinpoint one mechanism, how the red or the nets and the neutrophils. And coming back to the recent, and we all know we all have we all have been in the center of the pandemic now, and a lot of studies have very clearly demonstrated that in the COVID disease and serial lung obstructions, the plasma levels of nets are highly elevated, which leads to much more requirement of the respiratory and the ventilatory support, and of course, decreased survival. Fills, nets, a lot of vascular damage in the lungs, alveolar damage in the lungs, leads to thrombus formation and uh, poor uh, 
the poor prognosis of the COVID patients. Uh, recently, Irene and another colleague of mine have uh, worked on the editorial and characteristics of nets are actually uh, involved and how many diseases are actually net driven and you can see there is a long list and I think this is still growing. Right. right. And you know the, the interesting uh, well, when we did uh, this why mm -hmm. in, uh, in ATVB we found that some of these conditions based familial Mediterranean fever uh, then there is uh, cancer somewhere that cancer not to about this is a trigger for CTE. and to show you that this isn't um, uh, simply a construction there is evidence that net markers are elevated in people have clear clot. And I talked to my colleague in Turkey. He has uh, not very many, but uh, significantly increased uh, numbing cases in Bexet. And there is also in uh, Bexet disease, uh, neutrophil vasculitis and paniculitis. This is well demonstrated, as well as the gene mutation that affects I2. And even here, there's a definition of FMF neutrophils releasing net. So this seems to be central there. So we think this all closes um, strange um, um, stimulators for CTEPH to understand a biological uh, inflammation, neutrophil uh, activation, netting, Transdifferentiation of cells and fibrosis. So let me come back to the point. And you have mentioned that the prime treatment is pulmonary endarterectomy. It's a 1C uh, indication, and uh, the principle is shown here. It's a dissection of the media, and you produce these stick um, specimens that, that is taken, that is actually a specimen from San Diego, as you can see. And for those who are not operable, we have the I'm sorry. I I jumped to this, but pulmonary angioplasty is a recent modality that is very successful. And you can see here the opening of, of a, a nine segment with two years is normal. Um, the principle is a uh, principle of a, a dilatation without injuring the medial layer, which is very key. Uh, and this does, the structure has been pushed to the, to the wall by this four O balloon and this is restored. The data on BPA are accumulating. You can see here that the mean pressure goes down. This is a, and this is the Japanese multicenter registry, which is really the the, uh, uh, the the cradle for BPA as it is practiced. Has tried to understand the differential effects of BPA versus real ciguat, which is not um, uh, not any question today. But it's it's BPA does more in an obstructive disease. This is what I would have expected. And they say the, the 26 week geometric mean PVR decreased to 41% was, was communicated in 2019. In 2021, there was an uh, additional study which was uh, not the primary endpoint, was beyond the week 26. There was a question of the study. The previous real patients we were 53, and the previous BPA patients, 52, were taken on to the step number two. The previous real patients were BPA in on Rio in 12 cases, and the BPAs were taken to Rio in uh, 18 cases only if the PBR was still above four wood units and uh, 33 were cured. So this, for me, it speaks to BPA because you can cure patients. And the readout of the study is summarized here. There was actually no difference in, in fact, between the groups. that The incidence of SAEs related to BPA was lower when BPA was preceded by six months course of real ciguat. I think this is very interesting. These are small numbers, but the study, although the learning curve has to be taken into account, it is still probably very important but delivers very interesting data. Uh, I brought this study in because I think it's recent and uh, you may not have seen it, you may have seen it, and it gives a taste for what we don't know today, which is how to combine mechanical treatment with tablet treatments in CTEPH. Where somebody, somebody is here, I am here, and some of the uh, ladies and gentlemen have already moved on, but our sponsors have not, and so we are very thankful to be able to. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully this wasn't too much. Very nice talk, madam. We enjoyed uh, every minute of it. Uh, we have a certain query. So I will start off with a query which is there in chat box. My colleague of Sudhagar has sent. Uh, his query is doing with uh, pulmonary hypertension. That's a very good question. Um, according to the guidelines, we should only do it for group one. But I also do it for group four because we have published a vasoreactivity about 350 patients tested. And it, uh, it uh, very positive vasoreactivity defined by a, um, a decrease of the mean pulmonary artery pressure effective in CTEPH. Classic responders are rarely seen in CTEF, but um, uh, they occur. So, in conclusion, I think we should do 
uh, group one patients, because sometimes you don't know the final diagnosis at the time of the calf. So please do your precapillary patients who have no obvious other reason for precapillary uh, scleroderma with skin changes, etc. Was the follow-up of these patients, I mean, those who are responsive to calcium channel blockers, or the follow-up of these patients, yes. do they do? Yes, you, you have to, those who are uh, responders to uh, vasodilators, we acutely test with an O, and those who drop by, they are receiving calcium antagonists uh, at a high dose, usually 720 milligrams of diltiazem, or a similar dose equivalent of, of amlodipine, um, or isoptin, you know, the, the, in terms of blood pressure. And we follow them up with a catheter at six months, and they have to be on the drug, and their pressure has to be um, at the level of the... Okay, another question has come in the chat box. It's a corollary to it. Uh, can we start calcium channel blockers without doing a vasoreactive yes. test? Do they deteriorate? Yes, if you we cannot start? start a calcium channel blocker without hemodynamic testing. That is a Kunstfehler, we say in German. It's a no-go. <laughs> no-go. <laughs> no, you should. Because patients can, you know, there is a negative effect of some of the calcium antagonists, and they may do very poorly because you also lower system. Uh, the nice, the nice wording is please only in patients who are clear vasoresponders, and which means please do vasoresponses. Now that many drugs testing. have come which act on the nitric oxide pathway, like let us say sildenafil or tadalafil, do you think that uh, their actants will also? You may not gain anything extra by using a calcium channel blockers. We say versus this. Drug. That's an interesting question, but the calcium channel blockers. Uh, not replaced by any other drug. In any uh, research or documentation that you would use, a PD-5 inhibitors don't work actually in these patients, but calcium antagonists do work. And um, I, because, um, you know, it's an interesting question, but why not use the calcium antagonists? They're much cheaper. They, they, they cost you what for one month, cost 3000 euros, which is a significant health expenditure, you know? And if it, and I think it doesn't work, and, and uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors do not work, we know, right? We can treat patients who have uh, calcium antagonist responders, uh, who are vasoresponders, uh, not correct because uh, prostacycins are very uh, invasive drugs, you know. So uh, I think today there is no replacement. Another thought process is uh, we have drugs which act on nitric oxide pathway which acts on prostaglandin yeah. pathway, which acts on yeah. uh, endothelial and endogenous. AH is going to respond to this pathway drugs. Or, or should we use a combination of these drugs? Well, the guidelines say we should use a combination. Um, there is studies from Ray Benza on endothelin uh, receptor expression variants, uh, predicting treatments. In this patient, I give an ERA and Tadalafil. In this patient, I give a prostacycline and, uh, and an ERA. The, the, this has not... What the guidelines say, ERA plus PD-5. If the patient is low risk, and if the patient is higher risk, you have to use a triple combination, prostacycline, ERA. Right. And I'm appreciating the work by your uh, colleagues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, no, the comment I want to make is that I feel that there is a too much emphasis on the normal post capillary pressure in CTEF. At Narayana, which Professor Lang has visited, we see a large area yeah. raised RV diastolic pressures. Mm -hmm. And of course, because of the interventricular relationship, the left ventricular diastolic pressure goes up and so does the You're very correct. pressure. I, I completely agree. I would, if the, if the new guidelines leave in the wedge, in the CTEF definition, I would be the very good, thank you. Very wise, thank you. Many patients with CTEF have not normal wedge pressures. Very true. Advice to go through pregnancy, those who are calcium channel doctor responsive. Ah, that's a great question. Um, you never know how pregnancy affects vasoresponsiveness. You do know that um, some vasoresponsive patients lose their vasoresponsiveness over time. And uh, although pregnancy is general dilation, vasodilate, vasodilator media is circulating, right? It is not predictable what happens after delivery in the first weeks after, what happens generally recommend against. Uh, but I know many women who have vasoreactive pH who already have children because it was unknown. Um, I would, if I knew, I would recommend again. Also, madam, appreciating the work done by your colleague, uh, do you foresee any role for anti-inflammatory therapies 
to prevent embolism in DVD. Yes, the gene flow coming in to prevent an embolism of a DVD. Uh, like which like ones? Colchicine. Like colchicine. Yeah. Colchicine. Uh, I think colchicine. I don't know. But, uh, no, what I'm saying, I'm just postulating because you are saying that inflammation yeah, 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 yeah. is responsible. No, I think for it's a great idea. You know, I, I think that the uh, cohesive maybe uh, uh, diminishing network. I think it will be there. The question is, how will it be there? Will it be there as cohesine? Will it be there as DNAs? Will it be there as DNAs one like three? Will it be there one beta blocker plus DNAs? I don't know. But I think the real innovative approach to vascular disease will be, as you mentioned, by an anti-inflammatory gated mechanism. This is why Samrit is here, you know, because I think it is, uh, I think it's a good way to approach modern vascular disease. Yeah, a lot of studies are considering colchicine and DNAs, even for COVID, they are mm -hmm. underway. Mm -hmm. They consider DNAs and, of course, a lot of uh, acute conditions because DNAs and several other types of which form this would be, but it will definitely be anti-inflammatory and probably next targeted because nets are upcoming in almost every acute condition. We see them everywhere. Well, it's our little prediction, you know. Forgive us if it's effort in that direction that we can report. The drugs acting on the uh, DGF beta. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, to interfere with this central pathway may be very hard, you know. Um, because nets are in the very, like they're in the acute setting. And by the time a patient comes to see this, the patient is already very far in the chronic state that there is no coming back from this. Yeah. It's only surgical or it's only like, you know, you can treat with some therapies. But if we can target like nets or DNAs with DNAs, so for example, if beta, because if this over expresses, we have more fat losses and it drives much faster as compared to if we have less DGF beta. So I think targeting in the early stages is the key to control. To not have them, yeah. not have them. Yeah. From a chat box. Uh, uh, oh, there is one question regarding post COVID uh, development of pH, whether they have seen patients who develop pH post COVID, probably in a state change in managed adoption syndrome compared to the routine cases. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And it's very uh, legitimate because there is, in our textbook knowledge of how pulmonary hypertension uh, coming together. Uh, multifactorial with some genes and some uh, second hits. This is the current idea. Uh, we have always put viral infection in. Perfect uh, setting for, it's, it's, it's uh, pneumophilic, right? It, it's mostly in the lungs. It causes damage in the lungs. It causes small vessel thrombosis virus to fit into our textbook knowledge. Fortunately, we haven't seen any case yet, you know? And the question is, will we see it in two years? Will we see it in five years? Um, will we not see with regards to CTEPH is that um, severity of COVID infection, according to a recent New England Journal publication, is associated with the AB0 carrier status. The AB0, you are likely to be more ill and die from COVID. Same for CTEF. If you are non-zero, you are much more likely to get CTEF with any other risk. It means that uh, the, question who was, uh, the person who asked the question here in this, in this chat they may be right, but no cases as yet. Uh, there's one more question on the chat box. Is genetic testing required? How does it affect treatment or prognosis? Great, great. And in many large institutions of young patients who present with PAH, with a typical PAH. I wouldn't do it in CTEF. CTEF is not a genetic disease, but P and uh, BMPR2 carrier. We also alert the young women, usually, to not get children. Uh, for another reason, which, which is, of course, uh, for PAH. If there's already children, we would genetically test them and, and just watch out for them and, and get them uh, in. Fortunately, I haven't had those patients. I've only had patients, we have those. And we also look for other genes, like uh, endoglin, we look for uh, ALK1, and um, um, this is about it. We're not real big genetic um, uh, we're not a big genetically oriented clinic, but if we have a care, yeah, you have some see. more time. Uh, I yes, you have some more time. Uh, probably four minutes is okay. Okay. One more question I see in the chat box. Uh, if you read any of these um, uh, PA specific drugs, they are contraindicated in pregnancy. So how yeah, do you treat a great a pregnant PA? So you know you may have read that calcium antagonists can be given, right? And for uh, patients who are pregnant have significant pulmonary vascular disease. Usually I estimate that by a PBR uh, that's uh, in the six to eight, uh, the mean above foot on IV flow line. And I have, uh, I can show you pictures of my, my last ba baby was called Victoria. <laughs> 
she survived um, uh, pregnancy as a mother and a baby survived, unfortunately, but um, she's now happy and healthy and Victoria alive. This was a year ago with Flolan. She was in the COVID times, she came to the hospital. She was our only patient on the ward for, for about uh, three months. She was in a pros prostate cancer therapy still not picked up so much in our it's country. A, we had some experience with subcutaneous troposteal, but uh, our patients were not more. more yeah. Many of us withdrew from the subcutaneous troposteal trial due to this I reason know. because of lack of. But you know, it's not an Indian problem; it's a worldwide problem, and I have it as well. You need really dedicated personnel to manage sites, but it works, and it's in pregnancy because it has a it has a pregnancy warning, but. Um, uh, I think it would be even better than than Flolan, although it hurts. You know, it, it's it's a painful medication and it's painless. You know, but nobody has, really wants to do this because it doesn't. I, I don't get it. You know, they, they should work on the pharmacology of subcutaneous. I think with that, uh, I think all the good things come to an end. I mean, thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Ms. Smriti, thank you. for uh, sparing your time thank to you. talk to us. Thank, thank you for having you. us. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. With our pleasure. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kumar, Dr. Ranjan. Thank you, Mr. S, for your questions and input. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Thank you, officer. Sir, thank you, Angus. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ranjan, uh, Dr. Ranjan came. He was uh, there. Sir, he was there. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ranjan. It was a good discussion. Lot of questions. <laughs> Very good uh, enthusiasm by the audience. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Charyan, sir. Good night. Ah, thank you, Charyan, sir. Mm. Sir, don't worry. He joined, sir. I think the sir has forgotten something. Because he had replied to me that he was wrong. Thank you. Okay, then. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, Dr. Patil. Good night, officer. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Can I close, sir? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Sapi. Thank you, sir. I'll I'll end the end, sir.